What's going on, NBA fanatics? This is your friendly neighborhood, Memphis Grizzly Homer, Memphis X, and I talk hoops. Today, I am talking about a Grizzly victory and Jaron Jackson Jr.'s dominance. But first, every hero needs that theme music. This is Memphis X with I Talk Hoops. While you are here, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell to be notified every time I drop a video. I have a goal to reach 3,000 subscribers by the playoffs, and I'm going to need your help to get there. Thank you. The first five minutes of the game, the Grizzlies played against the Bulls last night. Jaron Jackson Jr. put on a master class of domination. Yeah, it was just five minutes. But the offensive and defensive domination that he flashed at that time really has been – it's it's something I haven't seen since – we had Mark Gasol starting the seasons off looking like he was the MVP of the league. Jaron Jackson Jr. started this game dominating. He ended this game dominating. And the thing about Jaron Jackson Jr. is he dominates offensively and defensively. And I can't wait till they get Steven Adams back and teams have to put a small on him or have to play two bigs against the Grizzlies. Because playing him with Brandon Clark, Santi Aldama, and uh, Xavier Tillman, it gives the defense an out on offense. They can always put their best defensive big on Jaron. But when you have Steven Adams, the other team has to put somebody big and strong on Steven Adams or he's just going to rack up offensive rebounds like it's nothing. So the question that the question is, can Jaron and Steven operate together? And they should be able to. Jaron should be able to be the primary focus. It's just that what will Steven Adams' role be in the offense if they're not spamming pick and rolls with him and Ja? I do not want to see Jaron Jackson back in the corner for most of the possessions on offense. I just don't want to see it anymore. There is no need. And to me, it's coaching malpractice to not use Jaron offensively every game to the maximum. Coaching malpractice. Jaron Jackson Jr. is probably, is no doubt the second the second best player on the team. He might be the most important player on the team. And I understand that Jaron Jackson has a tendency to get some offensive fouls if you spam the ball to him a lot and he has to drive or make post moves. But the only way he learns how to get by with it is repetitions. He hasn't been getting the reps in the last couple of years. He's been relegated to the corner, shooting threes, driving occasionally, you know, when he's playing with Brandon Clark. But other than that, we saw flashes last night on what Jaron Jackson can be, a guy that can absolutely take over a game offensively and defensively. Post-ups, drives, threes, block shots, interior defense, post-defense, picking up all-star Zach Levine on the perimeter and stripping him. The boy is bad, man. And I am just happy as a Grizz fan that the Grizzlies got the win because it was looking bleak for a minute there. And it is good that they pulled out the win. Now, something happened in the game that people really got took exception to. 
And that was the smattering of booze that seemingly were aimed at Dylan Brooks. And a lot of people, a lot of Grizz fans, took umbrage with that. They were very, they didn't like that. And I will tell you like this. For one, there were a lot of Bulls fans in the audience. And you could hear them even on the broadcast. But two, the fans have to have a way to voice their displeasure. It cannot be constantly cheer, 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 even when the uh, the team is doing poorly, even when a player is doing poorly. We are 53 games into the season. The Grizzlies have lost, had lost eight of nine going into that game. Dylan Brooks had had the worst 15-game stretch of his career. And now all of this is in the backdrop of, you got to remember, these things aren't in a vacuum. All of this is in the backdrop of Dylan Brooks shooting the Grizzlies out of a playoff game because a lot of fans were fed up after that. So he got some grace this season from fans. He's been, I mean, since December, he's been shooting poorly. It's February. It shows, not only does it show no signs of getting better with the shooting, he's still taking 12 shots every game. He's still shooting. Now, I commend him for hitting a a big three-pointer in this game, but I swear I would have hated to hear what it would have sounded like if he'd have missed that shot. Now, of course, the players, mainly John Morant, are backing up Dylan Brooks. He's got his post out about Dylan. Dylan acts like he's unfazed, but believe me, there's no way the home crowd can boo you and you not be phased. It seems like not only the trade deadline, but his contract situation has gotten into his head and it's affected his performance. But the thing about it is, you're in the NBA. You're a professional. You have to perform. And I know you're human. That's the one thing I empathize with the players about. They are human. They are not robots. But you have to perform. And the fact that he has a history of poor performances, bad decisions on the court, it's just, it's, it's, it's just took us over the edge, I would say. It took the fan base over the edge. And he was the focus of the ire of the, of the fans that looked like they were about to watch the Grizzlies blow another lead and fall to the Bulls who were on the second game of a back-to-back. And they had gotten down by, I think, 10 after leading by 10. And the fans were rightfully upset, not only with their effort, but with their execution. So hopefully it's water under the bridge. Hopefully the players can turn it up and we can get past this trade deadline and everything can go back to the good vibes Grizzlies. But I don't know. Like I told you guys, the test of a team comes when expectations are seemingly not being met. This is the first time that the Grizzlies have not met, been meeting expectations. Now, they're second in the West, but their play on the court, anybody who's watching them can see it has been lackluster, poor execution. Not only that, the roster is flawed. So... There's going to be a lot of questions to answer between now and the deadline. Not only for the team who answered their one question they could answer last night in the game, but for Kleiman, the GM of the Grizzlies. He's got to bring some more offense. You cannot function as a team with your bench having three players coming off the bench for a total of 40 minutes and not scoring a single point. Zeros. All of them. Zeros. Conchar had three rebounds. The other two didn't have any rebounds. Danny Green and Tyus Jones. They didn't contribute anything. 
Tyus Jones, three assists, but he had a turnover. And he played he, – oh, his game management was terrible last night. Terrible. I don't know how he's plus four. He was plus four because his game management was terrible. Terrible last night. So, hopefully this is the beginning of a good streak. We have the Timberwolves, who you know are going to be up for their Super Bowl. I expect Ant to look like Jordan that night. So, I don't know. Are we going to have Dylan Brooks to defend him? Will that be one of those games where we're in between <clears throat> in between trades and the players aren't prepared to play that night that we traded for? Is Dylan Brooks going to be on the team? It's going to be an interesting 36 hours. I think that's about how much time we got, about 36 hours left before the trade deadline. So I'll be here to talk about it. If something happens, I'll get up on this mic. Peace.